and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This verse is clear that faith pleases God and that he rewards those who come to him with faith. Our faith is the key to accessing all that God has to offer. Two words in this verse that I want to look at, Hebrews eleven six. 6. The first one is the word without, which means apart from or the absence of. It's speaking of unbelief or the lack of faith. The second word is please. We want to please God. And I want to give you a, a couple of phrases that are the opposite of the word please. And that is to be disobedient, to dishonor, to bring shame to, or neglect uh, to be to neglect to hear sometimes the opposite of word paints a better and a clearer picture for us uh, when we see the opposite of something so from God's perspective when we're not living a lifestyle of faith we're being disobedient we're dishonoring him we're bringing shame to him and we're not listening to him Suppose I read the first part of Hebrews 6 this way with those statements in mind. A life that is lived in a way other than true unwavering faith is a life that dishonors God, a life that defies or disobeys him, a life that belittles who he is and shows that we are not listening to him. Does this help you see how important faith is to our God? You see, many of us hear the Bible but we never truly live the Bible. When we don't live what we hear, there's going to be a space of unbelief in our lives that separates us from faith that pleases God and brings reward from him. So what does God reward? God rewards our faith when we diligently seek him. In other words, he answers our faith when we pray, not our prayers. And I know that may sound a little bit strange. It sounds a little bit strange to me, but it's true. God doesn't answer our prayers. He answers the faith of the one who is praying. And that's exactly what we see over and over in Scripture. And we're going to look at a few of those examples today. But we're going to be looking at what kind of faith honors God and receives the reward that we see in Hebrews eleven six. The first kind of faith is a faith that believes when it doesn't see. Faith that believes when it doesn't see. Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us the definition of faith. It says that faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Matthew 9.28, in our story of the two blind men, when Jesus has gone indoors, the blind men come to him, and Jesus asks them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. And before they saw the results, they said, yes, Lord, we believe. Do we believe that with God, all things are possible? As Christians, we would say, yes, nothing is impossible with God. In Romans chapter 4, verse 18, it speaks of Abraham, who was a man of faith. And this is what it says. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and became the father of many nations. Another version says, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and he gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Paul said to his disciple Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. That day is the day of his return. So we say that we believe that all things are possible, but would you say that you're convinced? Too often our words and our actions betray us. And I want to ask this question, what is it that you have been praying for? 
Because what you pray about reflects or reveals what it is that you believe about God. And the size of your request reveals the strength of your faith. If what you pray about is simply, God, bless us, bless, us, bless our food, keep us safe, those types of things, then I want to challenge you to believe God for greater and bigger things. You see, the Bible is full of big, bold promises because we serve a big, bold, awesome, and powerful God. So why are so many of our prayers so small? If we truly believe that nothing is impossible with God, why are our prayers often so small? Ephesians chapter three, verse 20 says, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. You see, God wants to show us his power and provision, his faithfulness and his strength. He wants to show us that he is capable of impossible things. I wanna see God do miracles like those that are recorded in the Bible. I want us to pray big, bold prayers. We need to ask and seek him earnestly and sincerely with faith and with confidence that God is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine in our wildest dreams. We need faith that believes even when we can't see. The second thing about faith that honors God, it's a faith that persists when nothing changes. These blind men cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. But Jesus kept on walking. He didn't answer them immediately. Verse 28 says, when he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him. Now, I don't know in that passage of scripture uh, if they were outside the house when they asked the question and then they just walked through the door with him or maybe they had been following him for the last mile without him saying anything and they just followed him to this house. Maybe they had been walking with him for, for half a day. It doesn't say But what we see and what we find is that they are persistent. They followed him into the house until he answered them. These were blind men. They obviously had to have help into this house, but they were persistent to follow him until he answered. Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourselves to prayer. The ESV version says, continue steadfastly in prayer. The idea is that we never give up praying. Keep persisting and persevering in prayer. Persistent prayer doesn't mean endless reputation. It doesn't mean painfully long prayer sessions. It means keeping our requests constantly before God as we live for him day by day, believing that he will answer us. And when we live by faith, when we live a life of faith, we won't give up. We may not see anything changing, but God's delay in answering always, always has a good reason. When we persist in prayer, it causes us to grow in character, to grow in our faith, and to grow in our hope in God. Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a story, a parable, of the persistent widow. And this is what it says. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with this plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God, or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? God is looking for faith. 
So if an unrighteous judge will respond to persistence, how much more will a loving God respond to us when we persist to reach out to him? In his book, Too Busy Not to Pray, Bill Hybels tells a story of a woman who was at church one Sunday when another woman was being baptized. And Bill met this younger woman uh, after the service, and she was crying, tears of happiness, but still crying. And he asked her, why? And as it turns out, this weeping woman was the daughter of the lady who was being baptized. And she told Bill Hybels, I began to pray for my mom to be saved 20 years ago. And I prayed and prayed for something like five years and nothing happened. So I thought, this is stupid. God's not gonna answer my prayer. But for some reason, I kept on. And as she told Pastor Hybels how she kept on praying to the Lord for 10 years, no answer. Her mom showed absolutely no interest in God. No willingness, no willingness even to consider the claims of Jesus Christ. 15 years and nothing. Now even her best Christian friends were telling her to just give it up. People have a free will. God can't force anyone to be saved, which is certainly true. But this woman kept on praying. In fact, she got to 19 years with still no results. She said, I almost gave up then. But one year ago, I was just about to quit, but for some reason, I kept on praying. And now with tears of happiness streaming down her face, she had admitted, now my mom is a Christian after 20 years. And this faithful Christian realized that God truly was able to accomplish all things. So I ask, what are you praying for? Who should you be praying for? And how long have you been praying? Let me encourage you to be persistent and don't give up. We're looking for a faith that believes even though it doesn't see and a faith that persists when nothing changes. And the third thing is a faith that trusts even when it doesn't make sense. One of the greatest examples of faith in the Bible is Uh, the story of Abraham offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. And early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a, as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, and to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that by faith, When God tested him, Abraham offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. 
Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Sometimes we can be so focused on the problem, trying to make sense of it, trying to understand that we can't see the answer. We become so focused on the problem that we don't even consider the power of God. Too often we stop praying, we stop reaching out to God because we can't see a tangible difference. We allow the circumstances to get between us and God rather than putting God between us and the circumstances. These two blind men didn't focus on what they couldn't do, but what they could do. You see, they couldn't see, they were blind. But they could hear, they could yell, they could walk, and they could follow Jesus. You see, putting God between us and our circumstances, it's how we can have faith when things don't make sense. I'm sure you've been in circumstances where it didn't make sense, like Abraham with his son Isaac. I also think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter three. They were told that they were to worship this idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they had devoted themselves to God. They had devoted themselves to follow him, to follow his word, and and to follow him in prayer. And they were brought into to Nebuchadnezzar because they didn't bow to his idol. And in verse 16, it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to Nebuchadnezzar because he had said, look, if you don't bow to this idol, you're going to be thrown into the fire, into the furnace, and who's going to save you at that point? And they said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty, but even if he doesn't, We want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Their words were this. We believe, God, that you can. And we believe that you will. You are able, and we know that you will, but even if you don't, And I think that's the place where we need to be, to trust God in the midst of the circumstances to say, even if you don't, though I might not see, though I might not understand, I will still believe and put my hope in you. If you read the rest of that story in Daniel chapter three, you'll see that they were thrown into the furnace. It was was turned up seven times hotter than it originally was. But the end of the story is that they didn't die. Amazingly, they didn't die. They were thrown into the furnace. They weren't burned. Not a hair on their head was singed. They didn't even have the smell of smoke on their clothes. God performed a miracle. But they were convinced that even if God didn't, they were going to follow him and trust him. We need a faith that believes when we can't see. We need a faith that persists when nothing changes. We need a faith that trusts when things don't make sense. Let me end with this scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. It says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set out before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and who perfects our faith. So the question is this morning, how are you going to respond? How do you respond to what you've heard about this message of faith? I want you right now in this moment to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to hear? And how do you want me to respond? What do you want me to do with what I've heard? There's a couple different ways that you can respond this morning. One is maybe you're not a person of faith. You've never put your faith in Jesus, or maybe you did, but you have kind of fallen off that that path. You're not on the course that God has marked out for you. And today you realize that the answer to the situation that you're facing, the answer to life, is putting faith in Jesus. He is able to do things that are beyond 
what you can imagine. Jesus gave his life for you. He put himself in your place. He died on a cross. He was sacrificed. His blood was shed. He was buried in the grave, but three days later he rose. Jesus raised himself from the dead. He is God Almighty. He can do anything. Nothing is impossible for him, and he can save even the worst of sinners. So no matter what you've done, God loves you. He cares for you so much so that he took your place. I want to ask you this morning to give your life to Jesus. Or maybe you say, I'm a, I'm a person of faith. I call myself a Christian. I attend church. I'm there all the time. But you realize today that you've been praying small prayers, that you need to trust more, that you need to persevere more, that your belief needs to take some action. And maybe you need to start praying some bigger prayers. Maybe you need to start believing for bigger things because we have a big God who can do impossible things. Let's trust him and believe him and let's not give up. If you've got a loved one who who is away from God and you want to see them saved, would you start praying? Or maybe you've been praying for a number of years and you felt like giving up. Continue to pray. And I don't know what situation you face right now, and it may seem insurmountable. Right now, we're in, a, we're in a worldwide pandemic, and we're not sure what the future holds for us. But one thing I can tell you is that I'm not worried, I'm not afraid, because I trust in God who is able to do the impossible, who can do all things, and I know that he can turn this around in a moment. Why is he allowing what's going on? I don't know, but I'm believing that there are good things that are gonna come out of this in the midst of all the trouble and the trials and the difficulties. God will sustain us and he will help us. So today, either you're putting your faith and trust in God or you're committing to say, I want a deeper faith to believe God for greater things. I want a kind of faith that persists and follows and doesn't give up. Would you join me as we pray? Father, today we thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you that it's by grace that we're saved through faith. It's nothing of ourselves. It's the gift of God. You have given us this gift of life, and it's by faith that we access that. Faith is the key to access all of the things that you have given to us, that you have done for us. And so today, God, I pray that we would put our faith in you. For those that are saying to to you for the first time, Jesus, I trust you with my life. Or for those who maybe have been away and are coming back to you. God, would you just strengthen them in their faith and in their resolve to say, yes, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come into my life. Save me. Forgive me of my sin. Change me. Help me. Be my Lord, be my God, guide and direct my life. And God, I know that you will fill them with hope. For those today who want to believe you for greater things, they know that you're a God who does impossible things, that their life would follow their words and that they would trust you more and more. That we would all fix our eyes on you, the one who is the author, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. Jesus, we trust you. We love you. We thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today and meant it in your heart, we want to say, first of all, welcome to the family of God. We're so glad that you made that decision. We want to encourage you to reach out, and you can do so and connect with us by texting the word HOPE, H-O-P-E, to 515-800-2014. That will give us an opportunity to connect with you. We've got some resources and materials that we know will help you in your new life as a follower of Jesus. If you like this message today, I encourage you uh, to... Um, to hit the like button or the thumbs up on YouTube and uh, just let other people know about it. If you'd like more videos like what you've heard today, check out our YouTube channel. Just search New Hope Urbandale on YouTube and there's a number of videos there that we know will be a blessing to you and to others. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great day.